welcome everybody to Vocal Impact Productions first launch event, Vocal Empowerment for Women in Leadership. Well, thank you. <laughs> I'm Laura Sokola, and I am so excited to have all of you here with me today. Um, we've got a bunch of stuff that I really want to cover with you, and so we're going to get right into it. As soon as we pass around our little purse here. This is the raffle bag. So at the end, we'll be raffling off a free 30-minute consultation on your vocal impact. So if you'd like to be in that raffle for a one-on-one -on -one session with me, please put your business card in here, and we'll, we'll do the drawing at the end. All right. Okay. And if I can also um, ask each person to turn off their cell phone, that would be great, or silence it. And I just realized I don't think I did mine, so <laughs> here's hoping nobody calls in the next hour or so. So we're all here. Everybody who matters is here. Everybody who matters is here. Absolutely. So let's get started. The goals of our session today are as follows. We want to learn how to speak clearly, confidently, and effectively. We want to learn how to make meaningful and authentic connections with our audience, whoever that audience happens to be. We want to get respect. That goes without saying. We want to be able to speak in a way that will close deals and get people to yes in the end. And ultimately, we want to be more successful, regardless of the context in life. And the fact is that one of these things is a precursor to everything else. We need to be able to get the respect of our audience in order to get any of these other goals met. So let's talk about this for a minute. The first lesson that I ever learned about respect was from my father. And that's dad with my nephew. Aww. Yeah, everybody, aw, there we go. <laughs> now, my father was a middle school teacher for about 40 years. I don't know whether that means he should be canonized or committed, maybe <laughs> one of the, a little bit of both. But after college, I decided to become a teacher also. And I was getting ready to move out of my little suburb in New Jersey and head out to Los Angeles. There's lots of seats up front. Please come join. And I was going to teach in South Central in the inner city. Slightly different world at that point. Now, whenever I had gone to my father's school, it always seemed like he had everything under control. The students seemed to genuinely like and respect him. His coworkers, administrators, everybody seemed to just appreciate him for who he was and what he did. And so I asked him, because my biggest concern at 23 years old, moving to South Central Los Angeles, was how do I get them to respect me? I was afraid of getting run all over. And he said to me, you know, the thing is, Laura, you can't just demand respect. You have to command it. I'm going to say that again. You can't just demand respect. You have to command it. And I don't think I really understood at the time what that meant. And it's been an evolutionary process for me to wrap my head around what it really means. And now, as I work more with executives, I talk to people in human resources, we look at leadership issues, there's a common theme that is often addressed or that's discussed, and that's things like executive presence. What is leadership? What is executive presence? And there's lots of qualifiers that come along with it. And one thing that's never explicitly mentioned but touched all around is an element that I would want to label the vocal executive presence. Of course, integrity matters. Of course, um, organization matters. But in the end, it's how you present yourself, how you are able to deliver your message in a way that is compelling, how you make people believe that you have an expertise and a knowledge that they want and they need, regardless of who you are. So let's go from that. On your chairs when you came in, you should have received a note frame, a little page to take some notes on. Hopefully you've got pens. And I want you to just take a moment and write down the name of somebody whose respect you want. It could be a group. It could be an audience of the board. It might be a potential client, your boss, an employee, a jury. Hopefully you're the lawyer, not the defendant, but that's not the point. Either way, you still want their respect. Okay. So take a minute and write down the name of that person or a descriptor of that group. Then, 
I want you to write down three to five qualities that you want those people or that person to see in you. Now those qualities could be that you want them to think that you're brilliant. You want them to think that you are patient. You want them to think that you are compassionate or that you're a fighter who will defend them and fight for them to the end. Take a few seconds. Think about who they need you to be. Do they need to know that you're the mom who's going to take care of them? Do they need to know that you're the pit bull who's going to always fight for them or something in between? So as you're writing down those thoughts, I'm going to give you a little bit of background. The fact is, I spent the last 12 years or so at the University of Pennsylvania, originally as a doctoral student and now as faculty, studying the voice pronunciation, and its effect on the listener. And there are some findings that I would like to share with you. But I want to contextualize it first. We talk a lot about public speaking and connecting with an audience, but that doesn't necessarily mean a formal environment like this, with the PowerPoint, the camera, the person up front with the you know, fancy schmancy pointer thingy-majiggy. But even in a one-on-one, -on -one, if it is a one-on-one -on -one with your employee, a quarterly, if it is a discussion with prospective uh, clients, if it is your weekly meeting on Monday mornings with your department, just very informally, it's a standard, everybody brings their coffee, you're good to go. These are all public speaking opportunities. Anytime you have to convince an audience of an idea, of a point, you want them to take action on, you want them to accept, this is public speaking. So it's not just formal, prepared speech. So we want to keep that in mind from here on. And when you are trying to be persuasive, when you're trying to convince and compel, people are going to ultimately judge you on your credibility, yes? There's an interesting statistic that might surprise you. In that judgment regarding your credibility, the fact is 38% of that decision is based on the tonality of your voice. 38% is based on the tonality of your voice. Now that does not mean that the remaining 62% is based on the content. The fact is 7% of that credibility decision is based on your words. Now let's put that into contrast with how we prepare for these meetings. <laughs> right. What percent of your preparation is spent creating things like your outline, your agenda, your PowerPoint, your script? Like 98, 99.5%? And yet, 7% of that will matter as far as your judgment of credibility. Oh, now, on the flip side, how much of that time do you spend with the actual delivery, practicing how you want to explain those data points to your audience? Is it 38% of your prep time? Well, not if 99% already went out the window on the paper. So we're noticing a little bit of a disproportionate effort to pay off, yes? Let's look a little bit about where we've been, where we are, where we're going. The fact is, since the 1960s and 70s, yes, legislatively and otherwise, women have definitely made some progress. But there's a difference between de facto and de jure. In reality, they, we still have a long way to go to find equality, to find that even playing field, to reach a true equality of status, not just in position, but in the respect and in the way we are treated and being viewed as true equals. Now, the interesting thing is, even when we get to the top, and there are 
now more and more women who are occasional heads of state, who are business owners, as many of you are. How many of you own your own businesses here? How many of you are executives someplace, or directors, high-level managers of sorts, right? So clearly, we're moving up, professors. But that doesn't mean that the problems of equality have ended. That just means it's a different kind of problem. It's a different level of challenge at that point. And so often, as was the case with Margaret Thatcher, you suddenly find yourself maybe being the only woman at that level, playing with a field of boys, um, or one of very few women at least. And so often, we still feel like our voices are just not being heard. Right. Um, now, Margaret Thatcher was an interesting example. I don't know if you're aware, but when she was being put in the position of running for prime minister, her party actually had her take voice lessons from the National Theatre Company because it was, her voice was too high and too sweet and was not viewed as something that was commanding of respect. And if you listen to her recordings before and after over the course of you know, several decades of her career, she on average was able to lower her pitch by about uh, half an octave, wow. her general speaking tone of voice. She needed it to be a more commanding presence. Um, now, it's not, it's not to say that the men are the enemy or men are always the culprits, because let's face it, sometimes we're not exactly the nicest people to work with either. <laughs> Much as we'd like to think that we are all sweet, it doesn't always happen that way. We are all sweet. I mean, we here are all sweet. But sometimes the people we encounter are less so. Um, and if you've been following discussions lately in the news, you've probably heard about the book and the organization Lean In. How many of you are familiar with the discussion? Sheryl Sandberg, the uh, COO of Facebook, has written what I think is a fabulous book. I read it myself. And um, has started an organization, leanin.org. And one of the major themes of Lean In is the fact that despite what societal issues are still throwing as far as roadblocks in our way, unfortunately, there's a lot that we do to get in our own way. A lot of things we do to pull back. We sit in the back seat. We try to hide this or we hunch down. We don't lean in. And I'd like to qualify that concept of leaning in to encourage you to learn to vocally lean in. And that's what we'll be talking about today. I actually had a conversation with um, Gina Bianchini, who is one of the co-founders of leanin.org. And uh, she was thrilled at the idea of having you all here today for this kind of a workshop and really felt that it is an essential uh, element of your presence. So from there, the fact is, as we mentioned, there is still something of an uneven playing field. Right. Men seem to have about an 80-yard range in which they're just sort of viewed as strong, aggressive, leader, whatever. Women seem to have about a six-inch window between weak, being viewed as sort of the doormat, the wallflower, and being viewed as the witch with the capital B. Right. So we somehow need to figure out how to regain a little bit of yardage, or a lot of yardage, on that playing field, as the case may be. But let's talk a little bit about authenticity and credibility and power. Because often, when we are suddenly finding ourselves in a room full of executive men, we often feel like we have to talk like the men, dress like the men, act like the men. The fact is, we're never going to be one of the men, and we don't need to be, and we shouldn't want to be. But then there's that balance, right? How do you get accepted if you don't seem like one of them? And I understand, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but that for um, people, and especially women of color, that there's an added level of feeling like there's the need to act white or talk white or somehow be less um, authentic to your cultural background. And these are all challenges that we find. How do you allow yourself to be who you are while still being accepted in a way that makes sense to the listener? But I would argue that it's really that authenticity that is what makes the connection with your audience, because people know when you're being fake, you know, when you're not being true to who you are. And I think that that authenticity is the key to making that meaningful connection. 
The fact is we all have multiple facets. You know, you saw that beautiful little boy on my dad's shoulders in the first picture. When I'm playing with him and we're doing Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which apparently is the big thing now in case you weren't aware, uh, they're back, they're back. Oh yes, they're back. I am the shredder apparently. Um, I do not talk to them the way I'm speaking to you now. It just wouldn't make any sense. Nor do I come here talking to you today as the shredder, as I would do with my kids. You have to realize that neither of those personas for me is fake. They are both 100% me. But I have to realize for a certain audience, I have to turn on and turn off different elements of my personality and let others shine through. Because I realize that those elements and that voice is what that audience needs to hear in order to receive the message that the voice carries. So it's not about being fake. It's about allowing, strategically allowing different aspects of you to come through at the right time, finding that balance of authenticity. Can I ask for a couple of examples out of the audience here of times when you have felt either pressure to be or speak in a way that is inauthentic to who you are, or if you feel like sometimes your voice is not heard? Do you find yourself in a context ever? Or am I just making all this up? Yes. Um, so I've been in a meeting with uh, mixed men and women around the table, and I would present like, an idea of like, something that was being discussed. And everyone would kind of nod their head and you know, not say anything. And then like, the next person to speak would basically revert to what I just said. And everyone was like, oh, great idea. We should really do that. And I was like, great. I'm thinking, like, that's what I just said. Like, where was this you know, like, enthusiasm? So I kind of felt like my voice wasn't heard. It just kind of got repeated by someone else, maybe at a different level that was much more recognized. Sure. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. I'm speaking to someone and I go on automatic. You go on automatic? Yeah, if I go on automatic and say things that I think I'm not really into it that day or whatever mm -hmm. it is, and I just get an automatic thing, I find that people won't get away. They just don't, uh, yeah, they don't respond. Sure. So, can I say one other thing? Sure. I'll tell you when I don't respond to people. This is a big thing for me right now the light word. I cannot so. listen to people when they're using the light word 500 times <laughs> in a paragraph. So, we're going to come to something similar to that in a little while. But if you'll allow me to use these two examples for just a moment, and then I'll take the other example in the back. Now, We've got a room of about 50 people here. And I've asked the question, and I want you all to be aware of certain behaviors that we all just did that hold ourselves and each other back. So I asked a question, and I got two responses. And I happen to know both of these women, and I know neither one of them is soft-spoken. And yet, I got two relatively soft responses. They were aimed directly at me. There was no eye contact with the rest and nobody else turned around to look, or almost nobody else turned around to look to see who's speaking. And I want you to think about this. In some ways, when you have a point to make, when you have a point to share, if you believe it is worth sharing, but you're not presenting it in a way to make sure that everybody can hear you, what is the message that we're sending? That I don't believe my message is important enough to confirm that everybody else can hear it. And then, what's the message that the rest of us are responding? We agree. <laughs> we don't think that what you have to say is important enough to pay attention to, because if we did, we'd turn around and look, or we'd ask you to speak up to make sure that we caught it. There were a few. There were a few. There were a few, but I'm, I mean, I can see the faces. So the fact is, the majority are still watching me, even though I'm not talking. And that's the challenge, right? And Linda, I know your voice rings through. You're, there is no question. Anybody here knows that that voice was not a Linda De La Rocca voice. So, so, but it's not a critique. That's the thing, right? It's just recognizing how we behave in different environments that allows who we are to show through or ways that we hold back instead of leaning in. And that's what Sheryl Sandberg was talking about in that book and the way that our voice reflects that. Eileen? 
I, I deal with a very um, interesting subject, and when I talk to people, they almost don't even want to listen to me. They just want me to do what I need to do to to make this problem go away. So tell, tell everybody what you do. I, I'm the CEO of the Center for Lice Control. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. Now suddenly everybody turns around and scratches their head. <laughs> so I, I do. I, I speak to children. I speak to adults. I speak to doctors. And really, everybody just wants. They don't really care so much what I have to say. They really just want me to get rid of it. <laughs> so I do, even though I have a wonderful presentation and I'm creating it now to um, answer to hopefully this uh, issue. But when you're dealing with a subject that people just don't want to even think about, they just want you to take care of, that's my challenge. Sure. And we all have a variety of issues where people don't want to listen to something that we think is really important for them to understand. So. Um, a, we can talk about it more one-on-one -on -one afterwards, but hopefully today, by the end, you'll have some ideas about ways to get through to them a little bit more directly. Yeah. Hi, my name is Eden, and the issue that I face is really sometimes representing the company voice versus my authentic voice, and making sure that the people that I'm discussing you know, this issue with and answering questions, it doesn't seem like I'm the company, and therefore that there's not a connection. Mm. So, you know, part of it would be figuring out what the company image is and what your personal image is and where there are overlaps and then how to bring that forward. So, and I'd be happy to talk with you about that more afterwards as well. All right, so from here now, what I would like you to do is to pick one of the people who just spoke. Doesn't matter who it is. And I don't want you to think about their story. I just want you to think about the sound of their voice. Just thinking about the voice, pick anybody who just spoke. And I want you to write down three to five phrases, words, just to describe the feeling you got from the voice. You're not thinking about their message at all. Right? If you were just thinking about them in Charlie Brown's teacher mode, <laughs> right? Wah, 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 wah. what did you hear? You're t basing this totally on stereotype. Her voice is X. She sounds like she is Y. Donna, question? So when Eden spoke, I, I felt she was very relaxed. So even though she stood up and she turned around and she looked at everyone and engaged everyone, I didn't feel like she was leaping at me. Okay. So I felt like I had an inroad to be with her. So just the, the, the quality that we're looking at right now. You, so you heard relaxed. Right, like okay. I was not intimidated. Okay. I, felt, I, I wrote down competent and calm. Okay, so calm, competent, not intimidating. Okay, so these are our three adjectives we're going for. We're keeping this real uh, simple for, this, for the moment. Okay, can I get a couple other adjectives? Yes, Betsy. I'm sorry, I don't remember your name. Eden. Eden. Oh, sorry. Eden or Linda, which? Eden. Oh. Linda. Linda? That's okay. And by the way, we're not just looking for affirmations. I mean, this is, it's lovely to do that, but I want you to really think about what you're hearing. Eden? And then Dawn? I forgot your name. Me? Yes. Jessica. Jessica. I felt your voice sounded disheartened and frustrated. Which is realistic, given the content that she was talking about. Dawn? You are, which is your voice. Mm -hmm. Jessica. <laughs> this is Jessica. Yeah. I would say youthful and a bit timid. Timid. OK. Yep. So I, I didn't mean exactly that way, but to okay. me, I felt like her passion might be disconnected from her. OK. So you're looking a little bit more at the content? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So where, <laughs> So where we're going with this is that, you know, Jessica, can I ask you to read a couple of the um, the adjectives that you wrote down for yourself in our first exercise as far as the things that you want people to perceive. Do you mind sharing? Okay, great. That's all the feedback I'm going to say about. Add a girl. And um, so the feedback that I would like from those um, folks that I've listed um, is um, providing high quality work, being a team player, 
being responsible for the work that's given to me, I'm being accessible and present to them, and also delivering on my commitments. So when we think about these kinds of adjectives and we think about the feedback we get, you know, we don't have time to sort of go through all of them, but think about the feedback that you get. And of course, if you knew that you were going to be presenting this formally, you were going to get feedback, of course, you would prepare differently, right? How you would say this. But that's the point. That's exactly the point. It's how you are perceived when you don't prepare for your audience. That is what creates reputation, right? Yeah, it's because it's the other 98% of the time that people hear you talk. And that's where they get who you are. And so this is the part where we want to start to think about how do we want to be perceived in general and how do we tend to come across? Where's the overlap and where's the disconnect? And what can we do about it? So, all right, now let's head a little bit into the issue of likability. Now, as women, we are just socialized into trying to make sure everybody likes us all the time. That's not what I'm talking about. But the fact is, your voice has both a cognitive and an emotional or affective effect on the listener. The emotional or affective side is one where you, know, you, you respond differently to the quality of people's voice. Right? I mean, personally, I'm never going to get hired to be the substitute to play Elmo or Darth Vader. <laughs> Neither one is ever going to be me. But you're going to have a certain response to the sound of any of either of those voices or mine. And that, based on the context, will make you want to listen more or want to listen less or be predisposed to already being doubtful or being open before you even get going. And there are ways that you can change, that you can modify your voice as necessary, like Margaret Thatcher did. We can adapt the nasality the pitch, the squeakiness, the raspiness, the breathiness. Um, but that's going to be the topic of a different uh, program. So if you're interested in that, then talk to me afterwards. But today I really want to focus more on the cognitive. The fact is, when you talk to an audience, the way that you use your voice can actually have these effects. You can help the audience explicitly to focus their attention on the keywords you can help them process the meaning and understand your message better. If you can get them to do that, you can also help them to remember your key points. Again, this is strictly through your voice. At which point, you can convince them, that's that compelling piece, uh, that 38% of judgment, making them believe you, and then you can compel them to follow through, assuming you've given them a call to action at the end all through the quality of your voice. Alternatively, if you are not strategic in your voice, if you're sort of haphazard or you're just letting things come out as, well, as they do, you can have the exact opposite effect. You can annoy them, you can confuse them, you can distract them. And at that point, they've already mentally checked out before they've physically left the building. So we really need to be aware of these things. And in part, the reason for this is because the way we hear in English, we don't hear in a linear fashion. We don't process sound in that linear order the way that we speak. We hear in chunks. We hear in tone units of sorts. And when you think about the tonality of the voice, the ups and the downs, and the rhythmic patterns, we latch on to those peaks, to the high points. We use those as anchors. And then we allow our imagination to fill in the blanks along the bottom, things that aren't stressed. We process from the top down. Here's evidence that everybody should be able to relate to. Song lyrics, fess up. How many of you ever used to sing a song and realized much later that you had the words wrong? <laughs> right. yeah. Daily. I mean, personally, when I was a kid, I used to love the song, What a Wonderful World by Louis Armstrong. Everybody knows that song? And there's a line in the middle of it, the bright blessed day and the dark sacred night. And as a kid for years, I thought the words were the bright blessed day and the dogs say good night. <laughs> <laughs> but when you think about it, I think I like mine better personally, but you know, why not? The fact is that when you analyze those phonetically, what I retained, what I accepted as true was the rhythmic pattern and the vocal peaks. And I allowed my 
my imagination to fill in those other blanks. Okay. So what does this have to do with us? We need to make powerful first impressions and lasting impressions. And something as simple as the way we introduce ourselves, the way we say our name, our position, or title, and our company, if we intone them accordingly, we can actually make the listener understand it and remember it. How many of you feel like I'm bad at remembering names? Okay, I'm about to be your best friend because I'm absolving you of that <laughs> responsibility. It is not your fault that you're bad at remembering. It is the speaker's fault for not presenting the information to you in a way that you can process. Okay. Now, of course, I'm blaming you on the other side because if people aren't remembering you, it's because you're not introducing yourself in a way that helps them. So we're going to fix that right now. The fact is, in English, we do have a fixed pattern of intonation that is expected to process people's names, company names. When you take your first name and your last name, oh, it's a window. the first name, your intonation should go up. There's a little break in between so that when the sound ends, I know that's the, the border of the word, that's the end of the first name. And then for my last name, the pitch is going to come down. So when I say my name, I would introduce it as being Laura, pause, Sokola, and come down. Hi, my name is Laura Sokola. Now you can make that pause a little longer, a little shorter, smooth it out a little bit if you like. But when you hear that, you know that there are two words, you understand them a lot more clearly. Now it may seem a little bit strange to do it this way, but that's because we've been using bad habits this whole time. And when you have a name, for example, that is not English, a name that is heavy, has a lot of syllables to it. If you, have, if you speak with an accent that is different from the accent of the listener, regardless of what those two are, if you're in a room that's got a lot of noise, networking events, right, your ears have to parse through all of that ambient noise and figure out which sounds are the ones that they need to remember for your name. Um, or if you just have a name combination that's not intuitive. All of these things are processing demands on the brain. And so you have to help your audience to figure out where the name goes. So using this pattern, I would do the same thing with my company name. My company is Vocal Impact Productions. Up, hold it, and bring it down. My name is Laura Sokola, and my company is Vocal Impact Productions. It's clear, it's authoritative, it's not obnoxious, I hope. <laughs> um, but it makes a difference when you're in that group, trying to help you wrap your head around it. When I tell people that the name of this seminar was Vocal Empowerment for Women in Leadership, I have to make sure that I articulate each of those words, that there's a little tiny bit of a pause in between, to let you just wrap your head around that plethora of syllables. Those are four dense words, and you need to understand all of them because each one has meaning that is essential to convincing you that you want to be here today. Right. So your turn. Can I get one or two volunteers to introduce yourself to the group following this? Your name and your company. Yes. <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> Hello, my name is Aaliyah Slappy, and I'm from the Enterprise Center. Great, from the Enterprise Center, wasn't that great? Can somebody repeat back to me, somebody on this side, what was her name and where does she work? Uh -oh. right. Helen? Aaliyah Slappy, Enterprise Center. Great, now say it authoritatively, her name is Aaliyah Slappy. Her name is Aaliyah Slappy and she works at the Enterprise Center. There we go, that up and down. See, and you wanna repeat that back to somebody with that same tone to let them know that you heard it. So now it's your turn. You are going to, in the next two minutes, stand up and introduce yourself to three people whom you do not know, three strangers. You're going to follow this intonation pattern, make sure there's a break in between, and when you are done listening to somebody's name, you're going to repeat it back to them to make sure that you heard it correctly, their name and their company or their position, whichever one you want. All right? And if they repeat it back to you and it's not accurate, make sure they are clear on who you are before you finish. Don't worry about all sorts of other intros. You can chat afterwards. There's coffee outside. But um, introduce yourselves and get that feedback from three people. And then when you're done, 
Have a seat, and I'll know we can move on. So, let's debrief. Let's debrief. Shh. So, as a participant in this exercise, what did you notice? What became clear to you, Amanda? I guess if I'm not, if I'm not I'm sorry, okay. My name's Amanda Riley. I'm from Catholic Social Services. And I noticed that if I'm not really concentrating on what the other person is saying, then I'm not going to remember what they said. Thank you. Yes. It's not always that other person's fault. Not always. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yep. Eileen Cyber. I got stuck on uh, what people did, the title of their company, and my my brain started to think, oh, what do you do? Or I saw something about that. So I kind of got stuck and forgot to reintroduce myself or repeat back to them who they were and what because I started thinking. How did it feel in helping somebody to understand what you were saying? Did you find you needed, especially with the amount of noise? Did using this pattern make a difference in your ability to catch somebody else's words or for them to catch yours? Yes. I think yes, it did. I'm oh, sorry. Phyllis Mass, uh, I think it did. And I think also using that pattern and looking directly at the person, uh, eye contact was yes. very important. And I realized that I don't always do that. Hmm. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Thank you, Phyllis. Okay. So, Let's take this in recognizing how just little things like the patterns, the pauses, the stress patterns that we use, how that makes a difference in somebody's ability to understand us and to process our information. We'll go to the next level and let's look at the power of tonality. Again, that's the ups and the downs in the voice. And we're all familiar with the issue of monotony, right? Nobody wants to be monotonous when they talk. But the fact is there's two kinds of monotony. The first one is the one we're all familiar with. Yes? So, thank you. See, I already jumped to my punchline at that point. It killed me. So, the actor everybody recognizes is? Ben Stein. Ben Stein, there we go. The movie? And the line that everybody remembers? <laughs> exactly. Everybody knows this one. And we all are very familiar with the effect that it has on the listener. Right. But the fact is that today there is a second kind of monotony that is becoming pervasive in people's speech. And it is a monotony that is colorblind, gender blind, age blind, and industry blind. And it has the ability to do all the negative things that we talked about previously, to distract the audience, to annoy the audience, to impede them from being able to cognitively process your message. And it tends to give it's what I would call the vocal equivalent of hair twirling. <laughs> okay. And the fact is, it's that habit that a lot of people have when they're explaining something to you, and with each phrase, their voice goes up at the end of, the fra of this expression, you know, because they want to not really enforce anything too hard, and they don't want to be too strong, so they're just going to keep inflecting the hope that you're going to agree with them, you know? <laughs> right. Like, you know, right? I mean, totally. And it's, but we have that image that it's like a valley girl throwback 
kind of thing. But that's really unfair to the girls in the valley because the fact is the last two places that I heard this were number one on the Iron Chef, our beloved Jose Garces presenting five plates to the judges. Up spoke every single, absolutely, Jose Garces, whose food I adore, but whose speaking pattern I would love to fix. <laughs> so he is great. And it's not just him, really. Most of the chefs will do the same thing. Um, and then I was channel surfing, and I caught on some home and garden or DIY channel two guys, 30 or 40 years old, up on a roof, flannel, tool belt, jeans, boots, installing a chimney liner. Up speak, the entire thing. So here you can see we've got the liner and it's made of aluminum and you, we've got it angled here so it'll fit into the chimney lining and so we're gonna install it and if you see some resistance, we gotta make sure that we... For real? <laughs> For real. And what that tells us is that you're not mentally organized. It's one giant tangent, one giant stream of consciousness. Because at that point, we're in mental list mode. We're just trying to remember what to say next. And when you think back to elementary school, back to first and second grade, when your teachers were teaching you how to read, read aloud, they would say, if you see a list with lots of commas, what do you do? At the comma, we've got our first grade reading teachers here, right? So your voice goes up at the comma. Right? And then when you see the period, what does your voice do? It goes down. Well, when you're in mental list mode and you haven't actually organized ex explicit points, we just think comma, 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 and, and, and. And then eventually I run out of stuff to say. So I guess I'm done. It's a run on. It's a if you transcribe yourself, you'll realize you get through like a page and a half before you actually need a period. It's, it's, I have my grad students do that. They, Love me for it. Um, <laughs> this is referred to as upspeak or uptalk or a little more technically high rise terminal. Y yes, Donna. Uh, I just wanted to give an example uh, for Laura. My name is Donna Titleman, and right now I'm coaching a pageant title winner, Miss Philadelphia. And on June 15th, Miss Philadelphia is going to compete for the Miss Pennsylvania crown up in Pittsburgh. And Dr. Laura, as we call her, came out to coach this young woman. She's a student at Temple University. She's an on-air broadcaster for meteorology. She's a championship golfer. And if you can ever imagine how important it is for her thoughts to be organized in such a way that among 36 young women where this upspeak is likely to be rampant, this could possibly give her the edge that she needs to take that title. So I just want to say, no matter who you are, this is incredibly important. And, and Laura is definitely the person to help. Thank you. Thank you for helping this. She's not a plant, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> so. so let's put this in a business context. At some point or other, we all have to pitch. We're pitching something. Whether we own the business or not, doesn't matter. But when we do our basic business pitch, think about your 30 second or your two minute elevator pitch, your M3 pitch, whatever your pitch happens to be. What do we need to include? Right? We go through our mental list. I gotta tell you my name, my company, my target market, my service, blah, blah, blah. And so I'm thinking, okay, let's see, my name is Laura Sokola, and especially if it's timed, right, if you're in a competition of some sort, you're thinking to yourself, all right, two minutes, ready, go. So my name is Laura Sokola, and my company is Vocal Impact Productions, and I work with uh, businesswomen to help them, uh, blah, 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 and I'm done. Voice comes down. We need to make sure that each of these points is a discrete item worthy of its own attention and worthy of its own period. Bring the voice down. That helps the listener understand topic is complete, moving on to the next topic. It helps them follow your train of thought. So here's an application. Voicemail. We all receive about a thousand of them a day and we leave almost as many sometimes. When we are leaving our message for someone or our own outgoing voicemail, what do we leave? We think about, okay, a name, our company, we apologize that we missed your call if it's our outgoing message of sorts, and we'll usually give some sort of an invitation to leave their message, leave your name, your number, the date and time you called, and a brief message, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Right. Your voicemail is your first 
impression that you leave on many people. And sometimes it's the most repetitive impression that you make on people. If you know somebody through the website, through a referral, you talk to them a lot on email, they know your text image, but they don't know you. And so often the first experience they have with talking to you is actually hearing your voicemail message. And so what image are we leaving through that? How much do we sound organized versus a laundry list of tangents and questions through that upspeak? So here's another counterintuitive uh, move on my part as far as ways for presenters to lose control of their audience, uh, but I'm going to throw caution to the wind anyway. And I'm going to ask you on your honor to do the activity and only the activity and take out your cell phones, not check your email, not check your messages, but just to listen to your own outgoing message. And I want you to listen to hear if you have upspeak and what your general vocal impact is. I know it'll take a minute to find, figure it out. So as you're listening to your voicemail, what do you hear in your own voice? Did, how many people did hear some of that upspeak, some sort of sing-songy kind of tone? A handful? Yeah? Some people haven't managed to access it yet, still figuring that out. So from there, I know everybody really wants to talk about that. Yes. You know, that's up to you, right? Because I'm not here to discuss the content of your message. That would be very dependent upon who you are and what, in, what information you believe your message, your, your callers need to hear from you. Um, whether it's your home voicemail, your work voicemail, it's going to differ. But also the tone that you use in delivering that message will change, right? Are you, are you the mom of three and the wife of whoever and the you know, dog owner and you got the pooch barking in the back and whatever else, that's, and that's the home image you wanna leave or do you need to convey, I'm the CEO, right? And how does that convey, how does that come through? Yeah. Left my work voicemail. I purposely tried not to have the upspeak, and it <coughs> sounds like I'm literally ready to like jump. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to be monotone yet jump. I mean, it's so monotone that it sounds like I have no interest in any message or anything that I'm doing. This is my work email. Mm -hmm. I mean, so my you went. Voicemail. So you went to the other extreme yeah. of the. And I know that I can hear it in my voice, but I'm trying not to do upspeak. So I'm purposely why oh, this is. Doing monitor. <laughs> so something. In, so so when you listen to that, what image do you hear? Sad. Okay. It's not sad. You hear tough. It sounds very businesslike, very tough. Okay. And how does that gel with the the words that you wrote down at the top of your paper at the beginning of the session, as far as the image that you want to convey? When you hear yourself sounding tough, does that match? with what you're hoping to convey to other people to gain respect? No. So what kind of impression do you want to leave? What are some of those words that you listed? If you don't mind sharing them. Uh, knowledgeable, trusted. Okay. So trusted. Tough, some kinds of tough can be trusted if it's that protectiveness, but others can be that standoffish kind of tough, that gruff tough. So. There are ways that we can modify, right? Things that we can do with our voice to soften that image a little bit. And I don't mean soften that doormat. Remember, our window is about six inches. But there's a lot you can do in that six inches and that you can spread beyond it in order to um, take back that yardage and still sound strong and authoritative without being standoffish and without being cold. So these are pieces to, to be aware of so we can play with that and make sure that we are conveying that image that we want. Yeah. I have to get into a whole other discussion on the, on sure. the content, but I struggle with this a lot. Okay. Just be, um, I know myself, hearing so many voicemails a day, voicemail messages, um, mine, I made the decision to keep it very short, but like almost cold yeah. <laughs> message. Sure. Because I don't like, listen, I don't need a 50 minute, like, it, because sometimes you have that second message that comes on by the, mm -hmm. by the provider. Right. And, and it's like, it takes me 10 minutes to send a voicemail. So, I 
purposely cut out the apology for missing the call. So that's, what do you think that, that I mean, well, that's I, I content, think about this right? kind of stuff all So the time. that's another issue to, to discuss as far as the content is concerned. Yeah. So what I want to uh, help us focus on is really when you decide what you want to say, then how do we say it in a way that conveys our intention, most importantly. And can I, can I work with you for a second on, on this discussion? Yeah. So I'm going to ask you to tell us your story, pretend you didn't say it yet, and I want you to use the exact same words to the extent that you can remember in explaining your, your scenario and your question to me, but I want you to avoid the upspeak. Because as you explained this to me, each phrase ended with up. It came up as you said it. So can you explain your situation one more time? And I'll coach you through it. But can you explain your story one more time? So my name is Erin LaBelle, and I'm with Commonwealth Agency. My name is Erin LaBelle, and I'm with Commonwealth Agency. My name is Erin LaBelle, and I'm with Commonwealth <laughs> Commonwealth Agency. Agency. That's it. And I struggle with trying to have a voicemail that is professional, confident, but likable. Okay. So this was a great synthesis at that point, so it was a lot shorter. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> I, one thing I've learned is that when you're not sure, <laughs> so, <laughs> but, okay, so, I mean, when you're not sure of something, sure, but at the same time, we don't, we don't want you to just hold back when you're uncertain. We want you to lean in, and this is the environment where we're all learning from each other's experience. You know, I've, I've used each of yours, you know, Jessica's, Linda's, so many people's, thank you for allowing me to use your participation as an opportunity to share and for everyone else to learn from. I mean, it, when you're in a group coaching session, isn't that what it's all about, right? You're, it's not just about you being helped from the coach, but you learn from each other's experiences. And so I, I do want to acknowledge and thank each of you who has let me to use your moment and sort of put you on the spot when you weren't expecting it. But I think everybody else who is here benefited from those discussions, didn't you? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So Erin, does that, does that help a little bit? Great. Is Bryn? this the same pattern with everything? So even when we leave our voice message, it's the exact same pattern for all of our conversations. It's something to avoid. Yes, that, right. Well, but you're asking me a question. And when it's a yes or no question, it should go up. And the fact is, I'm not trying to tell you never to go up, because if you don't go up, then you just sound like some, that old Wendy's commercial about like the Soviet, whatever, like, uh, you know, I am, I am here. I give you my name. This is my company. You do this now. I want it to come here. It just sounds very angry. Everything goes down. Everything is harsh. Everything is blunt. And that's not what we're aiming for either. It's, remember, the tonality is the variation and the contrast. The highs and the lows at strategic points. The high is where I, you draw my attention to something essential. And the low is when you let me know that something else is going on. So we need that contrast. That's the biggest thing. And this is where men or people with very gravelly voices tend to have a hard time because biologically, their voices have a much narrower range from high to low. And so they can tend to come across very disinterested very ambivalent, um, very gruff. And so we need to work with them on, on uh, expanding their vocal range. Um, and they'll all say, well, we can't do it. And then I say, yes, you can. Because if you go to a sports event and your team is losing and you think the ump or the ref made a bad call, you know your vocal range because within three seconds you say, A, come on. <laughs> and there's your peak. And then under your breath, you go, son of a, I can't believe the ref made that call. Idiot, who hired this guy? He's a bum. Throw him out. You know, so you've gone from your high to your low in 3.2 seconds in the senior true range. So we all have that ability to expand. We just don't tend to use it as much as we need to. We only tend to use a very narrow middle bandwidth. And that's where we come across as being less interesting, less interested, and less organized, and less authoritative and um, authentic to our people. So, but yes, when you leave the message, I mean, think about what it is that you leave in the content of your message. Regardless of what it is, we're in mental list mode. Uh, let's see, I wanted to talk to you about our meeting on Tuesday. Um, so this person's gonna be here, and this person's gonna be here, and uh, can you bring this? Uh, I need to talk to you about this also, and this, this, and blah, 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 and blah, 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 and um, yeah, call me back. <laughs> right, so we tend to go into that list mode unless we, our thought ends. If we forget what to say, we'll sort of finish it off and then we'll pause and then we'll start a new tangent. But it's, it is interesting to be aware of how disorganized we are 
in leaving those messages. Even when it feels organized, vocally it's not. Okay. Um, other questions or comments on this? Yeah. Do you think that, so, do you think our delivery is a direct correlation with our mental organization? Yes. Do you think naturally? Okay. Um, it, there is directly a correlation in the moment, right? It's not like you're a scatterbrained person and so you thus left a, a very heavily uh, upspeak laden message. It's not that broad, but at the moment you weren't really focusing. You were sort of running through, you were winging it in leaving the message. So in the exact um, opposite mm -hmm. scenario, you are mentally organized. Mm -hmm. I leave this voicemail. Mm -hmm. I need to mention A, B, and C, mm -hmm. is the natural, I guess I'm just trying to figure out from a training perspective, sure. is your, you would naturally leave a much more organized message with a lot less upspeak because of your mental. If you're aware of the fact that there's a correlation between upspeak and that sense of organization, most people don't know they do it. Right. I mean, when you gave me your original comment that I then picked on you for and asked you to repeat for us, you know, it's it's not until somebody points this out to you that you even are aware of that subconscious effect that it has on the listener, and it's pervasive. You know, I have worked with lots of uh, non-native English speakers who are professionals, accountants, lawyers, whatever else, and when they use that tone, and I point it out to them, they say, "Oh, you're not supposed to do that." I hear it all over the place, so I just <laughs> assumed that was normal. It makes people and it's, Yes. Yes. Absolutely. So, yes. And then. <laughs> this gets into actually why I was very interested in, in coming here today. When I was in law school, I was teaching international students. When I was in law school, I was teaching international students as a teaching assistant, and they all found it very irritating that American women ended their voice in an upspeak. So I became very conscious of it. When I was a summer associate later on the same year at a law firm. I was with, in a class with four other men and one other woman. And we were discussing a situation at the firm and we all had different opinions and they asked me why I thought that way. And I was very conscious and I said three things. I thought very much like a lawyer at that time, kind of bullet points. And I ended my intonation down. And I remember one guy in the group who was a summer associate said, you think you know everything, don't you? <laughs> all summer, the other people were a little bit shocked, but it really left an impression on me because I was specifically trying not to sound unsure of myself, mm -hmm. and then when I sounded sure and had my thoughts organized, then suddenly I was this. Right. The no -all. right. <laughs> That's that six-inch window. Right? As soon as you sound confident, you suddenly become the know-it-all. Whereas Ten Buck says, if you were a man, he would never have accused you of that. Yeah. 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 Right. It would have been the complete opposite. Right. 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 So, yeah. it's, thank you for sharing that. And that is a real challenge. So, okay, let's, um, I'm going to wrap this up a little bit. Uh, again, well, we've talked about that more or less. But, so, not at all. We're, okay. we're wrapping up and we're just a couple minutes over. So. Um, what I want you to take away with, and Bryn, here's a thought for you on the way out as well, for everybody. Um, from here on, when you leave, these are your takeaway questions to ponder. What vocal impact are you having on your audience? What vocal impact do you want to have? And how can you make this change? What can you do? If I can ask for one or two quick takeaways, what's something that you got today? Something that you've become aware of or that you want to take as a next step? What did you learn today? Eileen and then? Mm -hmm. To not um, spew out the monotony of the list. Okay. To, to focus on the points that I want to get across and, and bring them up. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And? Um, the biggest impact I got is to take some time to listen to myself when I'm mm -hmm. speaking. The messages giving information so we can more aware of it and see if I'm doing the up or... Right. And we do want some up, right? We don't want always down because then you just sound angry and belligerent. So, but it's finding that balance. Donna? Taking responsibility for people remembering me when I speak. Great. Great. That's Linda that's and then Betsy? Deal too, taking responsibility. And you're going to laugh at this probably, but I'm so happy. I just thought I was being intolerant all the time about the upspeak. Be intolerant about upspeak. Be intolerant about upspeak. <laughs> <laughs> it's really great to have that reminder. 
reality check, so thank you. Yes, I reaffirm and confirm and affirm all of that. Betsy and then Kathleen. I learned about giving my name. I'm sorry, I learned about giving my name distinctly and also what my profession is. So people really understand it. So I'm Betsy Miller, Child Care, Health and Safety, LLC. Great. Thank you. Very nice. Kathleen? I'm Kathleen and I'm thinking of changing my name. <laughs> I love your name, so I hope you keep it, but anybody else? Yes. Hi, I'm Carol Heiberger, and I think I'm going to go Carol Heiberger. Home. Carol Heiberger. 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 There we go. All That's right, it. and I'm going to go home and practice the name of my company, ExecuSpeak Dictionary, over and over and over again. Did I say it? ExecuSpeak Dictionary. Execu Drop it. ExecuSpeak Dictionary, and I'll keep practicing. There you go. <laughs> Because that's a big word, right? An exec you speak is not English, right? It's just, it's a made up word. It's a great word, but it's not intuitive. So it takes people longer to process it. And so, all right, so from that, thank you so much for sharing your examples. Um, if you are interested in future coaching and vocal impact coaching, um, on your chairs, one of the other forms that you received is a flyer. Bryn Tillman from Business Development University and I will be co um co-presenting together on a training for vocal impact for sales presentations specifically, which will be here in about a month's time. Um, we also can do groups. I'm happy to bring this kind of a training to your organization, to your company. Um, we're also, I'm working on getting certified to bring the, to have this type of training be available for continuing legal education, HRCI, and other credits. So if you are interested in that opportunity, please let me know as well. Um, we'll be starting some small group coaching opportunities. And small group for us would be about five people or less, uh, simply because the nature of what we're doing, you have to be able to vocally participate. So uh, a group of 10 or something would be much too big. Um, and of course, private coaching, whether it's project-based because you've got a big presentation you're getting ready for, or just in general, you want to work on your overall image and your vocal impact. Um, on your seats, do you have an evaluation form that I would be very grateful to have you fill out um, and before you leave, uh, Kitty Wang over here is my intern. Uh, she's hiding behind the camera. So Kitty will be standing by the door and collecting the, uh, the forms on the way out. Well, and so, yes. Put their names on that form? That's They're totally up to you. If you want to, me to contact you and you're interested in coaching at some point, then by all means, let me know who you are so that I can follow up with you. But if you just want to give me feedback in general, anonymous is absolutely fine. And now time for the raffle, which I promised you. I see my little thing over here. Did everybody have a chance to put a business card in if you want to be a, in the raffle for the 30 minute? Okay, quick, pass it around. 30 minute free coaching session. Here we go. Dawn? Pressure, pressure. Mary? Oops. There we go. Great. Stick it in. Okay. Thank you, June. I see. Oops, can you? Thank you. Can you pass that one down? I see the card over there. Can you pass that, please? Thank you. Great, thank you. Great, thank you. All right, did I get them all? Okay, that is just. Did I get them? All right, ready? Survey says, thank you, Linda. The winner today, drum roll, sure, you want a drum roll for me, Eileen? Drum roll is Jennifer Poplack of uh, Mattione Counselors at Law. Thank you, Jen. All right. So thank you again, everybody. If you would like, please reach out to me on LinkedIn or Twitter, Skype, go to our website. If I can have your attention for just 10 more seconds, you will, um, on the homepage is the mailing list. So if you wanna keep posted on group training sessions like this, uh, more free ones here at the Chamber of Commerce or some more paid larger scale events, uh, please get on the mailing list. All you need is your name and your email address and we'll be sure to keep you posted. And please send me any feedback you'd like. I'd love to talk with you all about it. Thank you so much for coming today. Have a great day.